Okay, good afternoon. Um, I don't believe we have any um, bomb scares planned, because obviously they're planned. Um, uh, and I'm surprised at the number of people who want to turn up to find out a bit about programming history. I take this as a positive sign, okay? Either that or you need a gentle snooze at the end of the day, having filled your head with all kinds of technical wonders. Um, I'm going to take you back to the past. Um, concurrent affairs, um, procedural programming unlocked. See, every now and then I do a talk where it, there's some element of the title that is deliberately provocative. Nobody, nobody else, I mean, maybe I should take a picture of you and just post it, came to a, would come to a talk on procedural programming because that's just like a, a thing that you don't do. That's a bad word. I kind of want to reclaim that because People normally use some particular word and they overload it with either the word meaning of good or the meaning of bad. And, they will, and at various points in the history of programming, the words good and bad have meant different things. Um, you know, you go to some functional shops these days and they go, oh, that's so object oriented as if it's a bad thing. Um, whereas uh, you get a lot of people looking at uh, object oriented code and they kind of go, yeah, object oriented code is really procedural and it's a bad thing. Um, these paradigms, all kind of jostle up against one another. Um, uh, they're all kind of good. They all have their context of applicability. They all influence at us at different points. They also dominate our thinking. And that's the failure, excessively getting absorbed by one approach. Um, and, and I've always been, you know, yeah, kind of hot and cold about procedural programming. Then I realized when I look back at my career, the number of times that an idea had actually come from the procedural space. It's just, oh, that's interesting. I didn't really appreciate that. But more importantly, how many of the lost contributions were from the procedural space? And they're kind of coming back, which is kind of interesting. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, my name's Kevlin Henney. Um, I have an interest in all kinds of stuff um, from kind of architecture level to um, coding level detail. Um, and so I'm not gonna really be talking about anything related to these books, it's just kind of context. Um, I'm interested in how all this stuff fits together, and I'm very interested in paradigms. Um, and functional programming was a real eye-opener to me uh, when I encountered it. Um, ooh, a very long time ago, um, over 30 years ago. Let's just, let's, just, let's just kind of not discuss the numbers, okay? Greater than 30 years ago. Because at that point, I had been programming in Fortran and C. And trust me, C is the greatest relief in your life when you have worked with Fortran. It is just, it's the feeling of not hitting your head against a wall anymore. It's, it's just wonderful, particularly if you're doing systems programming. And I started reading up on all these other languages and these different styles, and I came across functional programming. I was then also fortunate to end up doing a, um, a master's degree where I looked into parallel computer systems and uh, kind of, Focus and actually implemented a virtual machine that was kind of a lisp. Well, it was kind of an object-oriented functional thing. Um, and, and it's kind of nice to see this kind of coming in a bit more to the mainstream. Now, there are a lot of people these days who are saying, you know, functional programming is, ma is making a comeback. Uh, no, it's not. It's done. It's come back. If you look at the lines, they've plateaued. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of done its bit. And everybody really these days has kind of gone for hybrid or pragmatic. I love this because when people use the word pragmatic, it's a short way of saying not. You probably encountered this, you know, we're doing pragmatic TDD. We're not doing TDD. We're doing pragmatic agile. <laughs> we are so not agile. We are doing pragmatic functional programming. We call that procedural programming. When you actually look at a number of the concepts and you add in, you go to functional programming, you go, well, what if the functions aren't pure? What if just functions call other functions? Huh, what if we just share stuff? That was good next door. I want some of what they have. So there's this whole thing of like, actually that's what functional programming degenerates into. Um, if you're not careful. And one of the things that characterizes functional programming or rather procedural programming from functional programming is a different model or a discipline of state. Um, and you can arrive at some of the same solutions via different paths. A lot of people mistake immutability for functional programming. Uh, immutability covers a much larger space. Uh, functional programming is the answer that you get if you say, what if my functions have no side effects? Um, if you start the other way, you end up with a very similar solution. What if I'm not allowed to change data? Well, that means the only operations I can have can't have side effects. Um, 
They're, they have a kind of equifinality. You get to the same destination by two different routes. But that point about state change is kind of important because when we start throwing in concurrency, and I'll come to what do I mean by concurrency, because guess what? There isn't a unique definition. If you've ever been in a talk and somebody has said, this is the definition of concurrency, they are not entirely correct. It turns out this is not a standardized term. You can quite happily pick up one book that says concurrency is things running simultaneously on different, uh, you know, actually they are genuinely, in terms of physics, running simultaneously. And you'll pick up another thing saying that is not actually the case. They are time sliced with respect to one another. And you can go even further and say, not even there, mate, co-routines, stuff like that, which I will be talking about. So it turns out that at different times with different people, they have a very strong opinion about the word concurrency. I'm just going to define my terms here. I'm using concurrency like we do in English, OK? It means things happening at the same time. Any other qualification, I will make clear. So when we throw concurrency in, and it can degenerate in various ways, and fragment, if you like, um, there is a question of state change. And one of the most obvious mechanisms that people have in the past employed, they said, oh, yeah, we're going to throw threads at the problem, OK? And they got themselves into terrible trouble, which honestly, if you're a consultant, is great. Um, because people have kind of gone at it with the idea of saying, well, I went on a course. I've learned about a library. It's a very common problem um, that we have is we often think, oh, it's just a library. I've now got this capability. I'm just calling it. A it's just like, it's not just a library. When you introduce concurrency into a non-concurrent environment, what you do is you change the laws of physics of your program. You change the nature of time. There is nothing more profound than that. By the way, if you're ever dealing with a bug related to concurrency, you can console yourself with that feeling, I am exploring the nature of time and deep questions of philosophy. OK, that probably sounds better than I'm debugging some damn threading bug. But there is a point here. It's not, it's not a, a minor thing. I keep finding people say, oh, yeah, I just kind of sprinkled some threads on the code. It's just it doesn't work like that. I changed the laws of physics about how our system runs, and it's not working anymore. Well, yeah. When you look at it like that, it's kind of obvious. You've changed the nature of time. Now, why does this happen? So we're at the end of the day. It's time for a quadrant diagram. Let us talk about this quadrant diagram. Quadrant diagrams are nice and easy. That's why I put it at the end of the day. There's normally one quadrant that's very, very good, or one quadrant that's very, very bad. We basically divide the universe into four. So here are the axes. I have some state. And over a particular interval of interest, a particular period of time of interest, this state may or may not be shared. In other words, it is shareable. It is shared or unshared. Okay? Also, over this period of time, it may or may not change. It is mutable or immutable. And notice I'm saying may change. I'm not saying it has to change. The possibility that it could change, you know, there are things called if statements. You know, you don't have to commit uh, to that path. So in other words, we have this quadrant diagram. And it turns out that it's actually surprisingly easy to write systems that are concurrent. As long as you have a clear sense of which is the bad quadrant. Now, I'm red, green, colorblind. But I have chosen shades that I know work. And red is nature's color of danger. It is the color of blood. In other cultures, it is the color of celebration. Again, I refer you to the consultant's remark. Top right-hand corner, you don't want to go here. This is where the pain lies. In fact, we can even call it, we can give it a name, synchronization quadrant. Now, what is interesting here is it turns out three quarters of the diagram is, is a safe space. It's a, it kind of almost falls out. It's just like, well, if you don't share your data, you can do what you want with it. You can change it or not change it. You know, I can't see that. It doesn't matter to me. This is kind of like the classic Unix process model. You know, the Unix process, well, whatever you do in the privacy of your own process, you know, that's your own business. I'm, I'm cool with that. But I can't see that state. It doesn't matter to me. Even though I may be running concurrently with you, I, I can't affect that. It's not shared with me. I can't see it. In other words, that's totally safe. So that's a really simple way, and that is the kind of classic Unix way. Unix historically had a really negative opinion about things like threads. It's just like, no, we do everything with processes because they are a natural unit of isolation, a natural unit of fault tolerance, and a natural unit of safety from the point of view of the program. Okay, let's take a different slice. 
What if I can't change the stuff? This is, by the way, one of those interesting observations that we need to talk about when we talk about the words like synchronize. What is it that we are synchronizing? We are synchronizing change. What if there is no change? Again, more philosophy. What if there is no change? Then you don't have to synchronize. Ah, oh, well, that, that problem went away really quickly. So that's the other axis, okay? So what we have is these are the safe spaces. The top right-hand corner, yeah, things are gonna happen at the same time. We can all see it and maybe we'll change it, maybe we won't. Are you feeling lucky? So this bit, which bleaches out terribly in the light, but let me, let me clarify for you what this says. Functional comfort zone. This is the functional comfort zone. Functional programming is based on functional purity with the consequence that naturally things don't change. Immutability is part of the landscape, as it is with many declarative approaches. This is great, you get this for free with the paradigm. Top left-hand corner is the procedural comfort zone. You can change your state, but you don't share it with anybody. Now this, by the way, is also historically why we ended up with the problems of everybody in the, in the right-hand quadrant. Why do we end up in the discomfort zone? Because we were all over on the left-hand side, because it turns out that the lower part used too much memory and was too slow, historically. And everybody was programming in the top left-hand top left corner. They had this idea, imperative programming. You are entitled to change state, whereas actually we need to approach the modification of state as a privilege, not an entitlement. And when you look at it like that, if everybody's doing that and somebody suddenly says, okay, we can now have threads and things like that. It's just like, right, we all wander over into the new territory using our thinking habits and programming languages and we bolt things onto our programming languages. Even the new ones, Java is a really good example. A language that was created after we actually ended up with kind of uh, a fairly decent operating system threading being introduced, invented a new, and it was kind of like, let's develop an object-oriented language from scratch and then just bolt on threads. It's just like, they feel bolted on, that's because they are. That's not, that doesn't make sense in the way that the language is designed. And it's why it's painful. So there's a kind of an interesting point here. We've ended up here for reasons of history. People go in there, they say, right, I'm entitled to state change. How do I do this in a concurrent environment? Wrong. You are basically, you've got to approach it like, what if I don't change the state? Okay. Or what if we don't share? What if we keep everything separate? So this is the kind of interesting. Let's do a, a couple of other points of history. Um, Dijkstra introduced the word mutex, but he didn't introduce the construct. He introduced a thing called a semaphore. Um, the difference between a mutex and a semaphore these days is a semaphore is just a lock and anybody can lock it and unlock it. Basically, and let's be very, very clear about the purpose of any form of lock. The purpose of a lock is to eliminate concurrency. So whenever anybody, whenever you say, so why are you guys, you know, kind of using all this threading in your code? We want better performance. Why are you using all these locks? Because we want to kill that performance. But they never say that. It's funny, you know? The whole point is a lock is the anti-thread. Okay, that is something we need. All computers wait at the same speed. Okay, this is the point about Moore's law. When it comes to waiting, you know, oh, you can have a three gigahertz multi-core wait or a one gigahertz single core wait. You know what? They actually have the same amount of time. So he was introducing semaphores, but he referred to one as um, a mutex. He just gave it the name mutex for mutual exclusion. And that name was then later picked up to give a much more specific meaning of a lock with affinity. In other words, it knows who locked it. So somebody else can't come and unlock it. Okay, that, that's, that's the distinction. Um, and he point, talked about critical sections. We aim to make critical sections governed by mutex rather short. In other words, this is a very simple piece of advice. Just for context, this is Dijkstra writing in 1968. There is a small chance we might have learned a couple of things since then, but there are days when I wonder. Um, now, David Butenhoff, who was involved heavily with POSIX threads, which kind of really kind of standardized the stuff. In the 1990s, this was all up for grabs. POSIX threads are very much native to Linux in the way that that's expressed, the API there. Um, the only other Unix that was really seriously doing threads in a way that people noticed was um, uh, Sun's operating system. And they had a slightly different model uh, and naming. I worked on, I worked on uh, a system that used POSIX threads for real-time systems before that it was actually standardized. It's very awkward trying to write things to a moving standard. 
um, and that has not changed. But one of, the th one of the great comments from David Butenhoff was, I've often joked that instead of picking up Dijkstra's cute acronym of Mutex, we should have called the basic synchronization object the bottleneck, because that would change everybody's conversation. Yeah, you know what? Oh, what should we put here? I think we should put a bottleneck here. It's one of those things where you say it out loud. It's just like, <laughs> I read something about immutable state. Yeah, let's go, let's, you know, let's, go, let's go along and do that and leave those locks alone. And for just a, an understanding of why it is that we really need to understand why people have done an extraordinary job of really screwing up the performance of large classes of systems. Um, this is uh, from the IT here. And it's basically a logarithmic projection. And, and Sergey uses the same metric that I've used for years, the width of a laptop. Actually, obviously, he's using a smaller laptop. My laptops are about 30 centimeters across. That is, that is one light nanosecond. Give you kind of a sense of calibration. And I've always used that just to remind people that speed of light is shockingly slow. I mean, it's fast from a human perspective, but one light nanosecond, that's a cycle time of one gigahertz. Suddenly that doesn't sound so fast. And that's only over a space like this. You start stretching that piece of string and everything really slows down. But what is impressive when you start looking at all the optimizations available to us and you hit threading. Thread context switch direct costs. That's really slow compared to that. Indirect costs the slowest thing on the graph. Threading is a magnificent way, even without locks, of slowing things down. So we must be really careful about anything that does that. You have to really have a particular problem that looks like a particular shape. The amount of performance benefit you can get by just saying, you know what, we're gonna put this in a single thread and really make this work. It's impressive, you know? It's, and I've had that with teams, it's just like, have you thought about doing it single threaded? No, 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 we've got all these threads, Kevlin. Yeah, I know, and it's kind of like they're all treading on each other's toes. It's like trying to get everybody simultaneously through those doors at the back. It's just like, yeah, you've got a stampede problem here. So there's this wonderful talk. It's almost coming up to 10 years, I can't believe it. Brett Victor's The Future of Programming. He gives this talk as if from the perspective of 1973. It is wildly entertaining and deeply depressing. Okay, and he's basically looking at the landscape as it was in 1973 as the possible futures. And he wasn't talking flying cars here, although I still harbor a deep amount of disappointment about you know, our lack of Mars bases and flying cars. Um, but this is great. And he looks into the future. He said, threads and locks, they're kind of a dead idea, right? Or a dead end, right? I think if we're still using threads and locks, we should just like pack up and go home because we clearly failed as an engineering field. It's just like one of the most perfect mic drop moments. And it, there's a deep truth to it. So let's open up the variety. We, normally people are presented with locks and threads, and so I wanna, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. I mean, there's stuff that goes off the top of the screen, off the bottom of the screen. There are a lot of different ways of expressing ourselves so that this thing kind of does something either absolutely simultaneously with this or kind of simultaneously or kind of asynchronously. We need to be a little bit careful because certain words in people's minds have got attached to a particular meaning. So we see a lot of languages these days with the word async popping up. The problem is that they all mean something different. Whereas if I see the word if in a particular programming language and then in another, there's a pretty good chance I know what I'm looking at. If I see while, yeah, for, a little bit of variation on the syntax, but actually it's still the same idea. Async can mean almost anything. Ultimately, all concurrent programming is asynchronous um, but because you've changed the synchronous nature of time. It kind of stands to reason. Um, th but different uh, APIs and languages come down on this is our async. Um, so don't get too attached to a particular meaning. And if you see it in one language, be very careful about your interpretations of it in another piece of code. Sometimes it might be similar, but it might be a false friend. Um, now, what, I'm gonna, what I want to cover here is channels, coroutines, parallel blocks, and pipelines. These all came from the procedural world, okay? Um, and uh, they all, let me think, what do we got? 1970s, 1950s, 1960s. 1960s. And we compare it to this. These are not the only, these are great primitives. These are great tools for making stuff out of, but they don't, you don't want them messing, messing around with your high level application. But there is another area of threads that people tend to talk about these days, I've noticed coming back, green threads. Um, that's kind of been popularized by uh, certain work in certain spaces. A green thread is a kind of a post hoc name. It was named for the Java uh, green team at Sun, who implemented an approach 
to threading in Java uh, in the 90s, and there's renewed interest in this. But green threads are a much, much older idea. Um, I was using green threads before they were called green threads, so it gives us a strange way of talking about them. But they are, technically, they are user space threads as opposed to kernel threads. They are threads that run within the application on the thread of the application rather than in the operating system. Um, which means that they can be relatively cheap, but there are some interesting issues that come about um, with that. But they're not true operating system threads, uh, and they will be, um, as it were, uh, sliced up on that thread. And there are some subtle bugs that you can get when they don't behave like what many people now consider to be true threads. In other words, something actually runs, uh, or rather, something that's an operating system threads, and then there's true threads which run uh, one per core. Okay, there's these varying degrees, and people like to put the word true or real or concurrent or not. Con yeah, the landscape is interesting, but this is how we kind of slice it up or fragment it. Uh, so green threads have kind of come back in because people have realized, you know, those context switching costs are, can be, they can dwarf um, uh, the, uh, the overall benefits. And that's quite important because why is it that people want to do this stuff? And sometimes it is a direct, say, it's directly saying, I want to have the kind of concurrency that allows me to exploit the concurrency in the hardware or the parallelism of the hardware. I want that kind of, that's why I am doing this. But actually for many problems, and one of the original reasons that people got interested in this stuff and why event-driven programming and all this kind of stuff is interesting, is that idea of saying, I would like to organize my code around the shape of the flow. I want to decouple things. That, in other words, it's an act of decoupling. Now, if you've ever had the experience of looking at certain event code or async code or threaded code, you're sitting there going like, no, this is a tightly coupled uh, a pile of goo. It is anything but decoupled. Guess what? Welcome to programming. There are things you can use for good and for bad. It turns out that the same construct that you can use for decoupling things can also be used to couple things tightly together. But the idea is your, the original goal was, let's decouple these two things which are relatively independent, let's decouple them in time. Whereas we might think of normal discussions of decoupling as being spatial decoupling, the kind of stuff you draw in a diagram. Um, space in that case is only a metaphor. But there is that idea that what you're doing is decoupling things in time. I've got these three things and they're relatively independent, but I don't want to have to make a choice. And really I shouldn't be having to make a choice about when and what they happen. And I don't want to write the infrastructure that does that. That's why people want to do that. So there are these, these two things are not, you know, they're not contradictory. They sometimes overlap, but the desire for performance, I want to make the most of the concurrency available to me. And I want to decouple the expression of my uh, solution. Those two are actually, they pull you in slightly different directions. And which is why green threads become interesting again. Now, green threads are related to a thing called fiber. A fiber is kind of a construct related, it's a cooperative multitasking. Everything that I've kind of implied, but I haven't said explicitly, is when we use the word thread, we normally mean that something is preemptive. In other words, it's not down to the subject matter or the task at hand as to when things get executed. Um, we can switch at any point. And that may mean that that is actually running on a you know, you have one single core and the operating system or the runtime library is sitting there going like, I think I'll interrupt now and switch to another thread. Or actually we've got two separate cores, two pieces of hardware that are running this simultaneously. In other words, preemptive. We're not saying that there is, it's not bound to the nature of the task. And that also applies to green threads. But, Fibers tend to not work like that. Fibers tend to be, often they are, and the distinction is they are often confused with coroutines, um, and nobody's ever formally defined them, but I'm gonna use the sink of all human knowledge, Wikipedia, to help me. The distinction, if there is any, is that coroutines are a language level construct, a form of control flow. This is kind of important, come back to that one in a moment. While fibers are system level construct, that doesn't mean they're operating system, but the idea is that I can see coroutines in my code. I, I, I may have keywords and things like that. You know, I will say, here is this. Whereas a fiber is something I may launch, but then something else will get executed on completion or at a particular point, an IO point, for example. In other words, things run to a particular point and then there's a handoff. There's no preemption. There's, no, there's nothing slicing time up in the background. Um, but the idea that the coroutine is under the programmer's direct control and is therefore a control flow construct is really important because most control flow constructs, everybody's quite happy with the idea of, you know, I've got ifs, I've got whiles, and then I've got various flavors of these things. That's what people get taught. 
but coroutines are a control flow construct. Now this is interesting because they kind of become popular again. So let's, um, you know, coroutines are computer, pro so just on a point on the word, there's very relatively few languages these days that use the word subroutine. So if you're a VB programmer, you're familiar with this. Um, but, you know, the only people who use the term subroutine are VB programmers, Fortran programmers, and Star Trek script writers. Um, if you listen carefully, you will always notice they're referring to subroutines. So apparently at about the 23rd century, all this comes back into fashion, okay? The point there is pause for a moment because we often don't think about where our words come from. Pause for a moment and go, sub, subordinate, co. Ah, right. It's a, it's a symmetric version. It's this idea, um, jet, they are a generalization. In other words, coroutines are not a kind of a new subordinate idea because sub was already taken. Coroutines are the root idea and, uh, and the subroutines are kind of like a special case of them when you think about it like that. Um, non preemptive multitasking by allowing execution to be suspended and resumed. In other words, under the programmer's control. It's not at magic points, it's not under magic preemption or anything like that. And historically, you can find Don Knuth in the first edition of The Art of Computer Programming, Volume 1, written in the early 60s. Um, where he talks about them. He, he talk, shows you how to implement uh, coroutines. Subroutines are special cases of more general program components called coroutines. In contrast to the unsymmetric relationship, or asymmetric between a main routine and subroutine, there is a complete symmetry between coroutines, which call on each other. Now, Knuth was not the inventor of coroutines. Now, that, that claim goes to a particular gentleman called Melvin Conway. Anybody come across Conway's law? Okay. Yes, same Conway. Conway's law was 1968, and it's, a, it's an observation about the relationship between an, organizational, um, an organization and the things that it designs. You know, it, it establishes a kind of homeomorphism between, it's just like, yeah, the shape of your team or the communication part of your team will influence your architecture. And people are often surprised, wow, Conway's law is really old. <laughs> Not as old as his previous, one of his major contributions, 1958. Okay, he invented the coroutine. This is a, a paper of his, talking about the uh, construction of a, uh, a COBOL compiler in the early 60s. And he makes the observation, coroutines are subroutines all at the same level, each acting as if it were the master programming, when in fact there is no master program. It's kind of like a mystery story. You know? It's just that the coroutine notion can greatly simplify the conception of a program when its modules do not communicate with each other synchronously. How much code has been spent in the intervening decades where people end up going, oh, I wonder how to do this. Anybody got a switch statement and a flag handy? Or let's write a state machine, all this kind of stuff. No need, it's already, you can do this. It was, it's an idea that's been around for a very long time. We find it, in, we found it as kind of standard feature in some languages. Bliss was a um, systems programming language in the early 70s. Came out of Bell Labs, but you might be more familiar with another systems programming language that came out of Bell Labs. Um, that's the great thing about laboratories, they kind of invent all kinds of things and then one of them either wins or the other one loses. So Bliss ultimately lost out to C, um, but there are some really elegant design ideas in Bliss. And Bliss had the coroutine concept and importantly it didn't make a distinction between, it was a very primitive kind of coroutine concept. Um, it's a systems language, so therefore you expect it to be relatively level. The body of any function, any function, you don't have to have special keywording here, may be activated as a coroutine and or asynchronous process. So let me think, where are we? Half a century on from that. This sounds pretty cool. I want my languages to do this. Now, it is a systems programming language, so let's look at this, let's look at the syntax. And I will tell you when I have not implemented this. I will tell you code that I have swiped. I have not found a Bliss simulator. So this is stuff I've just taken straight from the papers. Um, you have a process name, process identifier, PID. Your function call, but now you put the word create in front of it. Now, it's a systems programming language and, you know, yeah, space is scarce. So you actually have to go and say, <laughs> by the way, I'd like you to execute this coroutine over here. So if you've got memory allocation to be done, you need to have done it. That's not part of the coroutine construct. That, that you don't get that for free. Um, it kind of gives you, it basically says, you give me the space and I'll do the rest of the work. Oh, and by the way, please make sure you tell me how big that is because I really want to avoid buffer overruns. Huh, interesting that C did not do that. Um, and then, really cool idea, you have a continuation. When you are done with this, you can now execute a separate instruction or operation, including another function call. It's just like, hmm, this feels really kind of fresh. You know, there's some really good ideas here. I'm happy to forego the 
please work out where you want the stack and tell me how big it is. I'm happy to give that one up. The rest of this sounds pretty good. And you have a very simple exchange, a very simple model. If you wanted to switch context, you did it in a very, as I said, you can build more sophisticated mechanisms out of this. This is a systems primitive. This is the value I'm assuming you get when you say, I want to swap between this co the coroutine I currently am and the, the, another one. But when you return to this point of control, you get a value back. And you can t say, I want to resume that one. Please tell it this is the value to pass. So it's equivalent extra J. Honestly, please, if you are a language designer, please have these conversations out in the room so that people use the keywords and you avoid things like extra J because it doesn't work. I mean, I'm sure it looks great and logical on paper, but when you use the words, people hear them. And they go, yeah, you know, that's a really bad keyword. Just a, just a suggestion. Um, so we've got that. It's a really interesting idea. You can build much more sophisticated systems out of this, but this is appropriate for a systems language. Um, and so why would we want these things? I mean, are they a one-trick pony? You know, are we just using them for a bit of, you know, asynchronous web server writing? It's just like, well, no, the web didn't exist back when people were inventing this stuff. Coroutines are well suited for implementing familiar program components such as cooperative tasks, exceptions, event loops, iterators, infinite lists, and pipes. Holy crap. That's like, that's a lot. There's a lot here. And that point about iterators is really interesting. Um, so this is a paper from 1974 uh, by Barbara Liskoff and her team. You may have come across the Liskoff substitution principle, which was named in 1991 by Jim Kaplin based on a 1987 talk by Barbara Liskoff. Yes, it's the same Barbara Liskoff who uh, won the Turing Award in 2008 for her work on programming language design as well as distributed systems. And this is one of her key contributions. This language, research language, um, foreshadowed all kinds of stuff. You know, it's, it's not something anybody used in production, but there's loads of stuff here. Basically, abstract data types, all of that kind of language, um, and iterators. I mean, the list does go on. There's a whole load of exception handling stuff as well. But the iterators, um, and Liskoff and team noted, iterators are a form of coroutine. Huh, yes. However, they use sufficiently constrained that they are implemented using just the program stack. For anybody who's used C Sharp, this is exactly the same thing. In fact, C Sharp pretty much lifted this idea and this idea of implementation um, uh, uh, from Clue. Because I remember looking at the thing in C Sharp with the yield keyword, and I said, I was thinking, you know, like, that looks a lot like the Clue one, uh, you know, because uh, I'm a programming language nerd and I happened to have read this paper years ago. It was like, this looks really familiar. And it also looks like some of the other things going on in the Ruby space and all that. But what was interesting was when I saw it in C Sharp, I thought, oh, oh, I wonder if they've done it. I wonder if they've done it. I wonder if they've gone and given back coroutines to the developers. No, they hadn't. They said, oh, you know, this is a special case. We can get rid of uh, the actual coroutines. Oh, it's so close. You could almost taste it. But, you know, uh, we, can, we can live with that. So um, here's a bit of clue. Let me translate this for you. Um, uh, string Charles is the name of the iterator type. Uh, iter tells us, hey, guess what? This is an iterator. It takes an initial argument. It yields. I love the keywords here. It yields a character. Um, uh, we've got, you know, we're going to start off with an index. It's a one counting language. Um, modules are indicated um, uh, uh, using dollars rather than dot notation. Um, let's see if that one works. There we go. There we go. Dollar sign. There we go. So that's instead of dot, which to the modern eye is kind of like, oh, that's kind of intrusive. Um, so, but it's, it, it's all there. And then we have this really nice little bit where we have the actual bit where we yield and we return to the caller and then we re-enter this and it keeps our state. None of these crazy state machines or big switch statements or anything like that and no need for threads. For a lot of problems, you have this idea of here are two things in cooperation. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a value. When you want more, you just let me know, okay? And I'll just go around the loop and all the state is managed for you. Elegant, simple and very, 19, uh, very early 70s, okay? So the 1970s was not just about um, disco and you know, great rock music. Uh, it was also about iterators and uh, some good language design. Now, um, here's how you use it. Now, all those people, it's just like, oh, hey, this is really cool. What's really cool about this? What's really cool is that's a modern for loop. How long did it take languages to get beyond the old for loop? It's a for loop, you're just counting. Yeah, but maybe I've got ways that I count, you know, like over collections and things like that. No, no, we're only going to allow you to take a number. It's just like, yeah, so this is a, it, this idea is caught on. It's kind of nice. Um, now, if I 
translate this to Python, I can kind of do very much the same thing. And we see the same kind of keyword there. It's, you know, it, it's pretty much identical. There, there's the yield keyword. And we see this popping up in a number of languages. But that idea has been around for, as I say, a remarkably long time. And again, there's that for loop. Uh, and this is kind of 1990s. So in other languages, we see this idea dominated very heavily uh, and was actually part of the reason for their creation. Um, Design and Evolution of C++ by Bjarne Straustrup, he published the book in 1995, which is actually now, seen, it's actually, it is further from now until, uh, you know, it's, it's almost, we're getting to the point where the time between now and that, no, actually it is, and his first C++ compiler, um, you know, it's actually, this is written closer to the first C++ compiler than to the present day. Um, but at that point, he described the motivation. He said the first real code to be written in C with classes before it had the name C++ was the task library. That's why he actually wrote the language to implement a simulation library based on coroutines, but decided not to put coroutines in the language, decided to have them as a library construct. And somewhere in history, that library construct got lost. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's lost somewhere in the 1980s. If somebody can kind of find it, you know, between the Indiana Jones movies um, and uh, hair metal, you know, please return it to the present day. Because it's, it was a really interesting idea. Um, and it was all based around a simple library, task.h. But that one got neglected. Now, there's a point here about what actually happened. Why, why have we ended up with the historical narrative that, we, uh, that we've got? Because preemption started becoming normal for operating systems. Everybody used to have simple, single-threaded operating systems with cooperative multitasking models. Doesn't matter if you're a Mac or Windows, or you know, if you were DOS, then actually you really just did have nothing else. You know, DOS these days now means denial of service, and you know that's been true for decades. Um, but there is this idea that the only people that actually had access to true preemption were on 32-bit workstations. And that was not most people. So therefore, this, this was the standard. But this idea, coroutines were just going out as I came in. It's just, oh, I'll see you. So they went, walked out the building. All this is kind of residual design ideas and bits and pieces of libraries that are no longer supported. That language, similar, in its first form, these days we know about Simula 67 as being the kind of the, 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 the progenitor of all object orientation. It's an extension of Algol, but before it got classes, its most important idea was, hmm, let's have coroutines. That was the idea. It's like, if you're gonna create a simulation language, how can you have, how can you model the real world or do anything with, how can you do anything event-based? That was their thinking in the 1960s. How can you do anything event-based and make, keep the code simple unless you have the idea of coroutines? Um, and so that was a simple idea. Um, Similar one, 1965, no objects, but it had coroutines to enable this idea, which were governed by an operating rule, which was basically the life cycle of the thing. And they were coroutines. It's not just a kind of coroutine, they were coroutines. They look different to a lot of modern coroutines, but that whole idea of objects have a life cycle. The original vision of object orientation, we might say, it was, oh yeah, you've got encapsulation, you've got in polymorphism, you've got inheritance, and you've got concurrency. But people found it really difficult to count to four, so we kind of dropped one of those but it was integral to the object paradigm. And a lot of this stuff also kicked in when we start talking about structured programming. So coroutines are a surprisingly old idea. They are coming back and they are about control flow, which is interesting because a lot of the languages that people are noting that are adopting coroutines, they're going like, yeah, you know what? This is all very, um, this is all very uh, new to us. And what is surprising for them is not only how old this stuff is, but there's a bunch of other ideas here about how this stuff is um, structured. And people were talking about control flow. That is a way of organizing your procedural programs. So there's an interesting thing. Sometimes, oh yeah, yeah, I'm using this language and that language, and it's really functional. No, most of what's been added to programming languages in the last half decade has been borrowed from you know, procedural hand-me-downs. If it's control flow, functional programming is not interested in control flow. There is no flow, there is no time, yeah? It feels like a statement from the matrix. There are also no spoons in any of these languages. But there is this observation. It's all built around procedures. And the, the object paradigm grew out of procedures. A procedure that can give rise to, you know, your, your procedures, your functions, they've got state, they've got variables, and you can nest functions inside them. What if you could hand off that state and it lived longer and it didn't just end when you hit the closing curly bracket? Hmm. 
a thing which has behavior and state in it. Wow, that's a really interesting idea. Somebody should do something about that. And they did. Um, so in other words, object orientation came from this. So let's have a look at a uh, coroutine implementation of a sleep sort. This is in Python. We are using the async keyword. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to launch a bunch of things. We're not actually going to launch any threads, but what we're going to do is we're going to just make things available with respect to time. And all the scheduling is done within Python. There, are, there is no threading here. Um, and so how does sleep sort work? And this is one of those, this is one of those um, algorithms you, you never get taught at university. It was only invented in 2011 um, by somebody on 4chan. It may be the only good thing to ever come out of 4chan. Um, you see how it works? It, it lets everything delay for a particular amount of time. Wait for it, wait for it. There you go, nine seconds. Um, you know, very elegantly, simply implemented, no excessive re, uh, use of resources, but please, please do not go into work tomorrow and say, we're doing sleep sort. This is how we should present user data. But there is a point here. It's a very simple implementation. There's no race conditions or anything like that. It's just time-based and a very simple expression of time. How else can we kind of explore coroutines? Well, let's talk about Fibonacci numbers. Because, um, I mean, somebody needs to choose one of these silly examples. But actually, it's quite a good example. Um, of course, there's the whole thing with Fibonacci that, you know, there's a whole load of jokes about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to this year's Fibonacci convention. It'll be as big as the last two put together. Um, I think it's funny. But maybe I'm just influenced by this joke. What did you think of my Fibonacci joke? It was as bad as your previous two Fibonacci jokes combined. Um, you know, but we got that there. So I can write this. So let's, I'm going to write this in C++. Given that we just talked about C++, let's write this in C++. And so I've got a standard recursive one. Now, the point about this is that, it, yes, it works, but it's hideously inefficient because you go and recalculate all the numbers. But it is elegant and simple and all the rest of it. So maybe we could cache our state. Rather than recalculate it, maybe we can cache our state. And in C++, I can create objects that look like functions. So maybe I can do it like this. I'm not, I'm not expecting you to kind of hold on to this. But the idea is now I've introduced state. I'm going to hold on to my previous value. So when you ask me again, it's just like I've got this one. And when I say it is the sum of the previous one and the one before that, I've already got these in stock. I don't have to recalculate them. Brilliant. Fantastic. Or as of C++20, we can use Coroutines. Are they like Bjarne's coroutines? No, they're not. Here we have it. Generator returns int Fibonacci, and then we got a magic yield keyword. But obviously, because it's C++, you can't have you can't have everything simple. So we put co in front of it. And so yeah, this is looking really good. It says that there's a logical flow here. It's just like yield the first two values and then go around the loop. And you don't need to have any remembered other object state because it's just your local variables. That's your state and nobody else can see them. You just reveal it as you go. And you can print out this stuff, and you can use it in a for loop, and you end up with the first 20 Fibonacci numbers. That was fantastic, this is brilliant. If I write it in Python, it looks pretty much the same, okay? You know, modulo some idiom. Yeah, that's kind of nice. However, there is a dark secret here. If you look very carefully, you're going to go, so Kevin, you can tell us what generator angle brackets int is. Yeah, yeah. You see, C++ didn't quite finish the job. People might say that as a general statement. I couldn't possibly comment. Um, so th this is how C++ approaches characters. I believe that my Swedish is correct. I have checked it. Modulo the IKEA uh, 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 extras. Um, yeah. It's like C++ said, yeah, we've got coroutines, and we think they're really powerful, uh, but we're not going to give you everything. Uh, you want something? You've got to build it yourself. <laughs> Absolutely got to build it yourself. You've got to, here's generator. It's a lot of skeleton code, and then there's this other thing which you have to then define, which is more, but you've got to do it yourself. Every single time I've ever tried to do this, I've had to spend a lot of caffeine and a lot of blog posts to try and get the right nuance. And it's a case of like, yeah, it would have been nice if they finished it. It's kind of like, it's one of those kind of like, yeah, we couldn't be bothering, but here, you want to carry routines, you got them. It's just like, what's this? You know, it's <laughs> really having seen what coroutines are in other languages, not quite what I had in mind. Okay, let's go back to structured programming. Structured programming was originally about sequential programming, but also in the late 60s and early 70s, there was exploration, but we didn't have the hardware at the time, but the, there was no shortage of ideas. Maybe it was the drugs, who knows? There, was, there were plenty of ideas around then, okay? And it's kind of like, 
there was this kind of exploration of all these ideas. So there was a structured concurrency. Um, and Dijkstra talked about it in that 1968 paper I just referred to. Uh, he said, when a sequence of statements is surrounded by the special statement pairing par begin and par end, this is to be interpreted as parallel execution of the constituent statements. Just as you know, certain languages use begin, end, or open curly, close curly, the idea is, well, let's have a special version. And instead of executing it from top to bottom, we execute it from left to right, so to speak, as it were. These are all done you know, at the same time for some definition of at the same time. They are done concurrently. This idea was in there. It's, it's been around for a long time. And in fact, uh, it made it into Algol 68. Um, the clue to the language is in the number. Um, however, that said, to be fair and honest, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, final report was 1973, because guess what? It was kind of delivered late. Um, but yeah, here's the 1968 language, but it's kind of half a decade late. I hope nobody minds. This, however, is one of the most influential languages you've either never heard of or never used. Um, if, you've all, if you wonder where any of these, key, you've seen these keywords in various languages, this is where they came from. Nobody was using these words in any of the other languages at the time. Um, it had a penchant for abbreviation and, uh, and certain things. So they, a lot of ideas. This was hugely influential language. Um, so the initial report had this influence. But it also had this idea. So I can write this, begin, Bene Vidi Vici, that will execute top to bottom. An alternative notation, because keyboards didn't have curly brackets, was to use parentheses. That is a standard block, OK? Executes from top to bottom. Unless I put the word par in front of it. In which case, they all execute concurrently for some definition of concurrent. And that's just like, oh, well, that's, that's kind of logical. Now, where I really first encountered this was in a language called Occam, which is kind of as dead as a doornail at this point. But 30 years ago, it was, a, it was quite a, what, actually in the 1980s, but there's some really interesting um, ideas in it. And it, it basically tried to generalize the whole concept and say, well, look, you've got two ways of executing a bunch, a bunch, that's very technical. Here I have a bunch of statements. How would you like them executed? Would you like them from top to bottom or all at once? And so you would choose. In other words, you didn't have extra qualifiers. You basically said, I want this one in sequence. It executes top to bottom. I want these in parallel. It executes all at once. It's really, and everything aligns because they're the same number of letters. Oh my goodness, it's like they designed this. And they even generalize the for loop. What is a for loop if not a sequence repeated? So from i equals one, four, three, in sequence is this. And you can do it in parallel as well. So you could generalize, you had a parallel for loop. It's just like it was all that really nice design, very, very elegant. But there's a point here. That was parallel blocks, which people have been trying to kind of reinvent, but have rarely tried to put back in the language. They often do it via a library. But it's such an elegant way of thinking. It kind of recognizes the, the top to bottom nature versus, you know, I have a set of things. Would you like them in sequence or simultaneous? That is a really nice idea. But let's explore another quadrant here. Looking at the procedural comfort zone, unshared mutable data needs no synchronization. There was an idea kicking around the late 80s, early 90s, called the coordination model. Uh, David Galanta and colleagues uh, came up with this, the Linda model of uh, concurrency and distribution. And it was this idea that perhaps if you separated, and this is a very powerful design idea that you can apply anywhere. Um, you, don't, you don't need to, it's not bound to their thinking, but the idea of we can build a complete programming model out of two separate pieces, computation, okay, and coordination. In other words, computation. Here, the computation bit is rather than taking Nicholas Wirth's algorithms plus data structures equals programs, which is a very, it's a book on classic structured programming. We take a different view. Programs are coordination plus computation. And we make, we make it so that what we're doing is we have lots of little pieces of computation and then we glue them together. And we have, maybe the glue, is, the glue language is the same, maybe it's via a library or maybe we use a separate language, but we treat them as architecturally separate. And there's a beautiful clarity to this. You can test your computation easily and take a step back. And now how would you like to plug it together? That's a very, and that's a, as I say, it's a powerful way of thinking. Um, but as they say, computation model allows programs to build a single computational activity, a single threaded step at a time computation. They were really clear about this. Keep it simple, because people can do th that right. Now, configure. Your coordination is, and how would you like the result of this to go to this one? Now, although I say that this is their specific language and description of this was late 80s, early 90s, Actually, we've seen the idea before. 
um, and actually very explicitly, the kind of the idea of the pipeline. And pipelines are really nice because they allow you, they, pipelines are friendly because they allow you to reason about things. They allow you to reason because the bits in, the, in, a, in a simple pipeline, the components, the parts you're putting together, that sequence, as a human being, I can read from top to bottom on a good day. And that's like, okay, I can do that. I can understand what's going on. You may notice that one of the things we miss in most of our programs and our programming languages is the ability to express concurrently on the page, uh, concurrency on the page. It's normally launch this or send something off there. It, when, but when you look at the code, squint at it and look at the indentation, there's nothing that says parallel there, okay? There's nothing that tells you that it looks like that. We have relatively few notations that afford that. Um, kind of classical music uh, stave notation is, is, is a good example of actually here is a notation that is truly concurrent. Um, but we don't really have that. So what we do is we simplify this. We say, look, two ways I can think simply, the flow of the data and the flow of the control. And we, you know, that's the elegance of a pipeline. The pipelines are really old. This is Doug McElroy's 1964 paper where he designed this. It took, uh, it took Ken Thompson six years to find the pipe symbol on the keyboard. But that was how it was implemented. That this was the original Unix pipe before there was even such an idea of Unix. And this idea is incredibly elegant. We should have some ways of coupling programs like garden hoses. Screw in another segment when it becomes necessary to massage data in another way. This is the way of IO also. This is kind of the Unix way. But it's a very, it doesn't solve every problem, but historically, pipes were the coordination language for procedural programs. That's how, that was one of the ways that they were supposed to be bolted together. We keep the bits procedural in a way that seems to be relatively efficient and widely understood at the time. And then we combine things differently. And so we kind of have that kind of view, but if we should kind of jump a little bit, there's an observation here, and this is about another observation of McElroy's, so we jump into this quote. McElroy's review is both an explanation and an exemplar of the Unix way. This kind of ties in with Dan, uh, Dan Tails North's talk yesterday, the Cupid, uh, uh, when he was talking about the Cupid properties. He talked about the Unix way, and it's a very important way of thinking, even though none of the Unices seem to follow that anymore. It was an, it's a profound way of thinking. It's compositional. Small programs that do elementary tasks, but which are written so they can be combined in complex ways. And this is also important because it gives us this idea of composability. Again, something that people find easy to reason about. And composability is a property that we have with pipelines, but not with locks and threads. If you try and take a piece of code that works with locks and threads and you combine it with another piece of code that works with locks and threads, you've got absolutely no guarantee that it's gonna work at all. It may deadlock, it may just do the wrong thing because they're not, they both have strong opinions. You've got two pieces of code that have strong opinions about the nature of time. It's very difficult to mix those. So there is a, a kind of an observation there. When we talk about these things, a lot of these things are based on queuing ideas. A pipe is just a queue with a bit of discipline, okay? And it's a it's a point to point, you know, producer, um, consumer queue. Although I always like to think, if you want to really pep up your vocabulary and confuse your colleagues, don't call a queue a queue. Call it space time decoupling because that is exactly what it is. It is either you are decoupling things spatially within the code or in time. We'll come back to that later. That all you can look at any queue and it's a space time decoupling. Um, no, actually, please don't take that as a naming recommendation because otherwise I'm going to get a lot of flack for that. But Kevin, I thought you said all this kind of extra word naming was a bad idea. Yeah, but honestly, space-time decoupling sounds cool. Use it in a meeting, just not in the code. Now, typically we do this because it gives us natural asynchronicity. We end up with a construct that is buffered. It's bounded and it's buffered. Watch out for anything that is infinite and unbounded. It looks kind of good in a computer science paper, but it's a terrible, terrible idea because it means you are subject to uh, bad producers and bad consumers. When you run out of memory, you suddenly discover the finiteness of infinity in practice, okay? Um, it, it's a painful experience. So yeah, always go in with a strong opinion. In the limit, you can have a buffer of one and it's still considered asynchronous, it's kind of a mailbox metaphor. I'll just put this here, you come back for it later. I'll leave it on your neighbor's doorstep, you can come back for it later type thing. Interestingly enough, if you make that single place, so that even on that level, it's useful. If you make that single place a single use, we have a name for that. It's called the future. And the other side of it's called a promise. It turns out we don't need, most of the things that people add to programming languages, it's just like squint at them right. And it's just like, yep, we, we have this. We already have this. It's a primitive from another point of view. But what about, what about a queue that has no capacity whatsoever? Does that even make sense? 
And, and it depends. On, it's, a, it's a question of perspective. No, it's not asynchronous. So if you ask, if your your definition of, of queuing is, that, yeah, it's got to be asynchronous, then no, it's then it isn't. But then again, this is a little bit like the number zero for a long. For most of human history, the idea of actually having a number for zero was a ridiculous idea. Um, but actually, having, a, having this actually makes sense. It implements a construct known as a rendezvous, where both of you, you can go off and do independent things, but you both have to be there at the same time for that. We actually have another name for this. This is called a channel, if you're treating it as a primitive construct. Rendezvous are an idea that we used in a few languages in the 1980s, um, and still, I think, is, a, is one of the more elegant ways of doing this. But a channel is a fundamental construct. The idea of like, we've both got to be here at the same time. I've, I've got no space to buffer things, so you better be there. I'm going to wait for you. Okay, you can see there's a limit to this, but you know, this was a fundamental idea that Tony Hall introduced um, in CSP, Communicating Sequential Processes. Um, I mentioned the Occam language earlier. That also had this kind of stuff. It was this idea, in fact, there's this wonderful, so my copy of uh, Jones and Goldsmith, they have this wonderful example of like, yes, you can implement anything with parallel constructs. The idea is sometimes, you know that little bit of fun that sometimes you have, you take a simple problem and you make it ridiculously hard. It's just like fizz buzz or anything like that. Actually, these, it's not a new idea. I, I, I love this book because it's just like, okay, there's an, there, that's what an assignment looks like in Occam. I shouldn't freak you out too much. That's what an assignment looks like. Or, or this semantically equivalent to let's execute, a, let's execute two processes in parallel across a shared channel. And I'm going to send you this value and you're going to receive it in a variable. You need never write a simple, humble assignment statement again. OK, uh, this is semantically equivalent. I'll be very careful about the word semantically equivalent because it really isn't when you start looking at the generated code and the expressions on the co your colleagues' faces. Um, so but that was all built. This Occam language was built out of CSP. Um, and as he says, we shall observe the convention that channels are used for communication in only one direction and between only two processes. Now, the channel idea I was introduced to in Occam. These days, people are more likely to use Go. That's the language that was influenced by them. They also get the option. By default, channels are indeed channels I described them. They are zero place. They are unbuffered. They are synchronous. Uh, they are rendezvous mechanisms, but you can customize them to be much more like queues and you can build all these other constructs. So the terminology shifts a little bit here, but it, it's there. So we can, eat, uh, and there's a beautiful switch where we can take something like a function and turn it into something like a running process that might even be considered an object. I'm going to take, I'm going to have two channels. They're both going to be channels of string. They, uh, you know, one's going to send, we're going to use one to send strings and the other to receive strings. I'm going to give them the name push and pop. And I'm going to run a function called stack. And that function is going to have a simultaneous concurrent existence with where I have called it from. And my only means of communicating with it, actually Go allows you other ways, but if you are using, if you're not going round the back and kind of like, actually, I'm going to meddle with things. If you just use the kind of like the easy off the shelf stuff, you can use channels. That's the only way we can talk. So there's no locks. But we do have synchronization because we have channels. So the idea is you don't get to say, right, we've set all this up. Here's the data. By the way, please remember to, re please remember to lock in and lock out, but then leave the door open. That's kind of like most you know, kind of lock-based programming. It's like, please don't touch the thing you're supposed to. There's a token over here. Please, please pay attention to it. Most people just walk in and try and grab the thing. Hence, race conditions. Here, it's a case of like, we're not even going to let you do that. You have a discipline. You go in that door and you come out this door. Simple as that. You want data? Well, you want to you want to push something onto the stack, send it down the push channel. You want to receive something? Listen on the pop channel. So if we push NDC, nice arrow notation, nice one there. Push London, and then we print the pop of it. We get this in reverse order. Again, notice the nice little arrows. They thought about this one. And we have a kind of question: What happens if I do that? And what happens if I pop an empty stack? Yeah, good question. I'm gonna. I'm going to be a very much a computer scientist about this one and say, well, we're going to leave this one as unspecified. That's a, a very elegant way of saying we did not solve the problem. You're on your own, kid. Actually, what it means in practice is, uh, as uh, Tony Hall highlighted, something very fundamental here that is a weakness of this approach. But you know, this form of failure is known as a deadlock. Okay? But I'm going to say that's, that's a feature. It's not a bug. If you do the wrong thing, that is on you. Um, there's a simple state model. You know, a stack, it can be. Empty, it can be non-empty. 
And if you push it when it's empty, you get what you want. If you pop it when it's not empty, you get what you want. If you push and pop when it's not empty, you get what you want. If you pop it when it's empty, you get what you deserve. OK? But what's the code look like? So this is the nice thing. It's what we do is we're kind of folding around. Uh, and just for clarification, sometimes Go is very much a procedural language. It's a procedural language with some data abstraction ideas and some channel ideas, uh, but most of its features, it's very, you can, you can find, go through history, not surprising based on the, the authors. Those ideas were already around, but it's very much, first and foremost, if you look at its DNA, this is modern procedural programming. In fact, that you can do other things in it, that's great, but that's its default axis. In other words, if I just sit there and write stuff, that's what it's going to look like. And these ideas all came from languages that were procedural. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I've got a function, it's got local state. And I want that local state to persist. We had this conversation earlier on with objects. What if I could keep the state around for a while? Well, here I'm actually going to do it. I'm going to make a function continually exist and then talk to the function. And it's going to have its local data. Forget all that private keyword stuff. This is so private, you can't even look inside it. You know, it really is very private. It's inside the block. And I've got a forever loop. And the first thing is basically, I'm going to take the depth. If the depth is zero, we are empty. So I am prepared at this point. You know, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen out for, um, at this point, I'm going to listen to a push. I'm not listening for pops. If you do that, you're stuck, OK? But I'm listening for push, and I'm quite happy to do that. I'm going to modify my own internal state accordingly. If I'm not empty, then I must be non-empty. So one of two things can happen. Either somebody pushes something onto me, or somebody wants a value. They want to pop. So I can receive. So there's something happening on one or two channels, a listen or a send. OK, so that's how I decide. A different control construct, OK? Basically, a non-deterministic control construct. Again, another 1970s idea. Um, um, but it's basically a case of, in this case, I'm listening on push. If I receive a push, then that means I receive a new value, and therefore I will append it to my array of values, and therefore I've now received that value, and I'm a stack that now has one more value than it had before. On the other hand, if I'm, if I'm hearing a pop, then I'm going to take that, uh, uh, that last element off and then slice it down. No, it's not the most efficient implementation. That's not my intention here. But what we've got here is a very simple idea. I've just taken a simple construct, a procedural construct, and turned it into a co-partner. And Go routines, as they're called in Go, they are not exactly co-routines, and they're not exactly threads. That's kind of all squirreled away at the back. But there is this idea of you think about it in terms of channels. You don't think there's a thread over there that I want to talk to, and I'm going to lock things and unlock things. You say, we fired that off, and we're going to have a conversation. We just make, better make sure we have the right conversation, OK? Uh, this is a kind of question of orchestration in the code. OK, so the final trick. Wouldn't it be fun if you could actually get rid of that array? Because that array, yeah it's, yeah, it's OK. But we already have a stack. It's called a runtime stack. Why don't we use the runtime stack to express the stack? Whoa, there's almost an XKCD cartoon in here. So let's do that. When you create a stack, it's initially empty. That's your forever loop. And when you call a function called non-empty stack, then you go into the non-empty stack, you call it with the value that you're keeping on top. Top is now a local variable. So now when somebody says, I would like to pop this, you return your local variable. You return the, val the one value you had on the stack, and you return it. Or you call yourself again with the new value. So now, you know, if you're not comfortable with recursion, I'm sorry, this code is really not going to help you. It's not going to make you more comfortable. But what is interesting is that this approach to express, so we've just replaced the stack with a stack. Genius. Um, so yeah, this is the summary of the talk. Um, no, more to the point, this is actually idiomatic if you were doing this in Erlang. Again, another language whose influence and whose model, the actor model, definitely not a procedural thing. That's hence why it's outside the scope. But I want to show you there is a convergence here. We can actually see how this touches onto some of these other ideas, but or more importantly, how it relates to other paradigms. And there is an adjacency between paradigms which people don't, uh, uh, which don't appreciate sometimes, and sometimes it's hard to see. But from a historical perspective, I want to go th back through all of this stuff, and it's just like it's not that I'm, it's not that I'm hankering for the, the you know 1960s or 1970s. Honestly, you know the, some of the music was great, but we get to listen to that music these days. That is what you know. 
That's, that is what things like Spotify are for. It allows me to access the past without having to put up with the food quality of the past and other issues like that. Uh, on the other hand, there were fewer pandemics back then. So, you know, it's a bit of, it's, yeah. The point here is that what we need to do is say, hey, look, that feature's really nice. It's coming around again. That's in that language. And I have seen this before. It's a better sense of history. So I hope that that's either screwed with your mind or educated your history or given you something to think about or is going to make you dive into a glass of wine right now because I realise I, I am the obstacle between you um, and the uh, evening's entertainment. So thank you very much for your time.